Hello, welcome to this edition of Palmdale City Library Supports the Arts, Building Bridges. Very happy to welcome you. The plan and intent is that again we will post this pre-recorded program on the library's YouTube channel uh, in the month of July. And I want to make you aware, if you're not aware, that by the time this post, the library uh, is already back to our, our pre-COVID full service hours for the public and we'll be gradually reintroducing in-person programs here at the library. Please always feel free to contact us by phone, uh, come by, or check our website at www.cityofpalmdale.org slash library. Look forward to seeing you in the library as we uh, get back to pre-COVID library business. Our regular hours, just want to mention those again, are Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then on Sunday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. <clears throat> For today's program, we're again very happy to have Jesse Davidson here as our facilitator and special guest, Laura Hemingway. I'm going to say a few things about uh, Jesse and Laura. First, I want to again Introduce Jamie Lee Beck, the Assistant Director for the Library, and wear many hats, and walker on water, things like that. Yes. <laughs> um, Jesse, if you're not aware, was born and raised in the Antelope Valley and has been a bassist since his early teens. He's been involved in local music scene since 2010, working professionally in Southern California since 2012. His resume includes working at the Lancaster Performing Arts Series, teching for Last in Line, Lita Ford, Venice, among others, and touring as an independent musician with Reverend Red and Rogue. In August 28, he began writing for the Valley mm -hmm. Press, covering local music, and his weekly, weekly column releases each week in the showcase section. So be sure and check out his, his uh, column in the AV Press. <clears throat> and today, our special guest is Laura Hemingway, and a little bit that I've learned about Laura, and I look forward to, to hearing you, myself, here today, Laura, is that uh, she is passionate about that she likes to access creativity, her own and others, through art, music, and writing. And that is certainly what this program is about. And she says that her, <clears throat> her, her personal mission includes accessing other people's creativity via songwriting, all ages, all genres. So that's just a little teaser about about Laura. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Jesse. Well, thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Uh, so the theme of today, as all of these lectures have a theme, uh, it is uh, something that Laura sent in some information about, you know, sent us a bio about herself and, you know, a little bit about her background. And uh, Basically, the theme of today is creativity is a natural human trait. And uh, I was not fortunate enough to take Laura's class at Antelope Valley College that she taught for many years, which was the songwriting class. But uh, many friends of mine have, and she's she's among the, uh, what I would like to call a great lineage of ed educators that have been in the Antelope Valley. Uh, people like Lee Madelon, uh, various band directors in the Valley. She's a part of that uh, through Antelope Valley College and has taught generations of you know students about music and songwriting. And I think the, the my favorite thing about Laura is that she has the ability to bring out somebody's gift of uh, creativity and that could be through music songwriting art through just not only her nature but um also just you know her methodology through teaching so today will be more of an interview as opposed to a uh, just straightforward lecture series uh and so laura first of all thank you so much for joining us today we appreciate you my pleasure yeah uh, and so just to give people a little bit of background about you, uh, can you kind of talk about how you started teaching at Antelope Valley College and your history with education just to get this started? Well, <laughs> um, I, I guess you could say um, that job at Antelope Valley College was, was um, my lifelong dream at age 27 coming to tr fruition because um, you know, I, I was a generalist as a musician growing up. I was in orchestra, I was in band, 
I took ballet lessons. I was on stage in the in community theater. You know, I I was that kind of a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and my main focus was piano. So um, all of my training had to do with learning how to read music, other people's music. Yes. Um, and how to perform other people's music, and how to teach it, how to teach that skill to other people. Um, so you know when I um, graduated from high school, you know, having been a a marching band member, an orchestra member, a choir member in high school, um, I went to Ventura Community College and I kind of got um, um, a calling to teach on the community college level because back then everything was free. Um, You didn't have to, I think we had to buy our books. Yeah, we had to buy our books. Um, But there wasn't any tuition or anything like that. And my parents couldn't have afforded to to send me to university for four years. Um, So two years of um, college music majoring um, with an excellent faculty enabled me to be able to to transfer um, to UCSB as a junior because I passed all my entrance exams. And I just you know, even at that age, I thought, you know, this is, this is so great that um, somebody with financial difficulties can get their first two years of education for free. So that's when I kind of got the idea in my head, I really want to teach at the community college level. And um, so when I got to UCSB, um, I majored in piano, I got um, my BA in piano, but way back in seventh grade, Mm -hmm. I, I uh, won the student conducting competition. Oh, that's great. And, and that was when I I realized I can stand in front of a bunch of people at that time, it was 12, 13 year olds, <laughs> um, and make sense of what is on this page and turn it into music. And um, that was in my head the whole time. So once I got my bachelor's degree at UCSB, I, um, auditioned for the conducting program yeah. um, for the master's program and I was accepted. I, there were two, he always, the conducting teacher always took two students I got to be one of them. So which meant I was in front of an orchestra once a week um, for two years. Yeah. So I had really good training at UCSB. Then, you know, this was way before the internet, I started looking for jobs. And the first one I applied for was out in a desert where I'd never been. Mm-hmm. Um, it was in August because the 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 um, former teacher at Antelope Valley College had gotten a job late in the year, and um, so I drove out there where you are, um, yep. never having seen a Joshua tree in my life, <laughs> and um, took my interviews, and um, I got the job, and um, you know it was it's, it's it was a small department, still is. Yeah, um, but really small then. I mean, there were two full-time people. Um, my position was instrumental music, and the other position was choral music. That was Glenn Horsepool at the time. This mm-hmm. was 1978. Wow. Um, and my my uh, my teaching load included um, music theory, piano, fundamentals of music. Um, Woodwind ensemble, um, sight singing, and orchestra and band. Wow! All of all of those things, and I was happy as could be because that's you know I'm a generalist, and um, that was that's what brought me to the Antelope Valley. And I think that was your question. Yeah, no, that I don't was remember. Just, well, no, just to give people, I forget sometimes just because, you know, I've known before I met you, I've known about you through musicians in my social circle within the valley because they took your songwriting class and they were part of the music program at Antelope Valley College. And then, of course, when I went through that same program later on, uh, you weren't teaching there anymore, but, you know, people talked about you a lot. And so when I finally got to meet you, I understood what, uh, you know, what people were talking about. And I think it's, uh, you know, the impact that you had on my peers, you know, at the time who were still attending AVC or had attended and were 
uh, you know, in our musician social circle was really impactful because they had nothing but positive things to say about your teaching process and the experience that they had in your various classes. And so uh, I wanted to give people a little bit of background about, you know, how long you taught at AVC and, you know, sort of how you, you came to the Valley. And um, I think it's interesting you call yourself a, a generalist because it's uh it's one of those things where i think now people want to focus on a specialty so much but like you being able to uh cover a wide variety of areas in music is really helpful and was able to actually get you that sort of teaching position so i think that that's kind of interesting yeah. yeah yeah i guess i mean my backstory is kind of long but it's because i'm old <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was going to say, that's a wealth of experience that you have to pass on to your students. So that's, uh, you know, that's important. Um, so with teaching all of these different classes, you've sort of, I think, can kind of study where a lot of different young people are coming from. So you're getting people from all different walks of life coming through Antelope Valley College, and you're observing, you know, what everybody's process is like, what everybody's background is, and sort of how all these students think. And doing that for decades, you really have an idea of uh, how innate, you know, creativity is as a human trait. So I guess uh, my next question would be, you know, how specifically would you define that with creativity being a human trait? Do you, because it is something that you have to practice and work on, and it is a craft, but there is something, uh, innately uh inherent about creativity and that i think we all you know have music in us we all hear music we can all hum something right now if we wanted to we could all you know there's phrases that come to mind that we could write down and that could be a part of a story so there's all these little bits of creativity that happen spontaneously and you know is it more of a craft or a discipline you know where's the line between it being natural and being something that's developed and practiced I think that's a it's a great question um and in my own experience i honestly thought um i was incapable of creative thought mm -hmm. um, my mission on earth was to teach people how to do um you know what mozart did yeah um, and um, when i was on the podium to recreate this beethoven score um, but at one point in the 90s kind of late 90s um i started becoming not disenchanted with the dead guys, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> right, right. But, but just like, what about, um, what about, what about our own creativity? What, what is it that we can access ourselves um, this time around on the planet? You know, and yeah. um, and that's why I, you know, that, that old saying: when this, when the student is is ready, the teacher will appear this book fell into my hands and it was um, this book called The Artist's Way by hmm. Julia Cameron. And um, I still maintain um, for any kind of artist, whether you're a musician or um, a, a visual artist or a mm -hmm. writer or, or just anyone, um, if, if you use her techniques, she's got two of them, and I used them, I ended up using them for the songwriting class, which I kind of inherited once um, Glenn Horsepool mm -hmm. retired. Um, and when I took over the commercial music program um, back in the, in the mid nineties, um, the curriculum was, was mine to look at and figure out what I wanted to teach. Right. And, I, and I had just been um, exposed to this book, The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. And the, the two techniques are mainly, the huge one is um, when you wake up in the morning, roll out of bed, open up a notebook and write three pages Yeah. of anything. Yeah. Literally anything. And, you know, um, then close it. And it, you don't, you never have to go back to it. Yeah. You never have to edit it. Um, just do it. Yeah. So, and I thought this is just, you know, I was 40 at the time, 40 ish. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I thought, this is just, I don't know about this. This seems really weird, but I'm going to try mm -hmm. it. And then the other, her other instruction, um, which isn't as important in my experience, but she feels it is, is to take yourself on, a, on an artist date once a week. 
um, <laughs> okay. which, which means, you know, head over to the art gallery and just walk around. Um, just take yourself to um, um, out, out, on, out on a walk by yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whatever you would do with a person that you valued, um, take yourself on that date. Um, so, but the three pages were, were key for me. And so I started doing it and I never would have believed this in a million years because yeah. oh, maybe two or three weeks into this, um, the, the choreographer at ABC, um, the dance teacher at the time was Kathy Bingham, mm -hmm. who started the yoga program over there um, oh, okay. years ago. But um, but she was choreographing shows at the time, and I'd worked with her a lot. She came to me and she said, "You know, I have an idea um, for a ballet, and I want you to write the music for it." <laughs> and I went, "Kathy, I can't do that. I don't know. I'm not. I'm incapable of creative thought." That was my mantra. I would tell people this. Wow. Now I yeah. can recreate other people's stuff, but I don't write music. No, no, you can, you can. It's based on this book. And um, I said, right. She says, it's going to be a children's ballet. Anyway, she showed me the book. And it, all of a sudden, I know this is going to sound crazy, but yeah. music started coming into my head when I, mm -hmm. saw this, when I saw this book. And it was called The Rainbow Goblins. So anyway, <laughs> it, it's a really cool book. And the guy that actually wrote the book and did the paintings for it, um, is the guy that did the storyboards for Never Ending Story. I don't know if you know that movie, that sort of uh, fan I've, I've, fantasy I've heard movie. Of it. Yeah, I heard of it. I haven't seen it. I think you dig it. It's, it's, it's sort of a fantasy movie. It's kind of old, but anyway, this guy yeah. did the storyboards for it. So, wow. so anyway, long story short, I started writing music. Um, some of it was just based on illustrations in the book. Some of it, I would go to the dance studio over in the gym and she would have choreographed some movements for the color red, for, wow. the, color, for the color green. And there would be like a dancer portraying mm -hmm. those colors. And I would just look at the movement and go, okay, I can hear music going with that. And I would have my little, my, uh, it was called the W5 synthesizer by, yeah. by Yamaha at the time. And, um, a few months later, this 40 minute ballet was born. We performed it for a week at the Yelpak. Um, wow. it, we bust in kids from schools all over the Antelope Valley, filled it 758 seats, two performances a day yeah. for, a, for a week. Wow. My, my music that I wrote. Yeah. All because I was, I think, because I was doing morning pages every day. Mm -hmm. This weird thing happened in my mind, and I, it was kind of a revelation to me. I, I truly thought, look, if somebody like me, who truly feels I can't create anything right. except, except copy, yeah. um, can do this, I wonder what I could do for my students. So that's yeah. about the time that I was revising the curriculum for commercial music, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this in songwriting and see yeah. what happens. Yeah. So all these people show up in the songwriting class in the fall. And the thing that's so cool about community colleges and why it's so relevant to your agenda for this series, mm -hmm. Jesse, yeah. um, is that we've got every age, we've got yep. every walk of life at the community college. And I had everyone in that class from high school students who were taking it because they were really smart and you know, they were just about done and they were only sophomores mm -hmm. um, to, um, you know, to legitimately, le legitimately aged community college students, mm -hmm. to, um, to, to moms, to, um, I mean, every walk of life, yeah. veterans, oh, wow, what valuable stuff those guys brought to the table. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I put together this, um, this sort of agenda for every class meeting, kind of based on the Julia Cameron principles. And, and it worked and stuff started coming out that was great. But the main thing that everybody had to do in order to get an A in the class was to write morning pages. Yeah. And some people were very resistant to that. Yeah. But the ones that did it, like the guy you interviewed last month, Ian McCarter, who who did yeah. it 
religiously you know yes. i mean his his morning pages were legendary i would yeah. i would go you know to his station and here his notebook was filled out you know 21 pages for the for the week yeah and I, you know and, and i i probably embarrassed him but i would like to <laughs> show it to everybody it's like look you guys this is what he did and then <laughs> at the yeah. end of class everyone had an opportunity to present um any kind of music that they'd created that week and ian would always get up and write and 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 perform some song that you know everybody would go what yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. oh you're so talented and he, it was his first opportunity at to write songs he'd never done it yeah and and no one w w believed it you know and of yeah. course he is blessed with a beautiful voice yes um the way he sings is, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but he hadn't even really played guitar before at that time. Right. He had played some mandolin, um, but not guitar. And so, you know, he's kind of like the perfect example. But to whatever degree anyone participated in that three pages of morning pages, um, they were the most successful if they just did that. Yeah. No. And uh, wow. Uh, with all of that you brought up, it's um, there's a lot of stuff that's not only, uh, you know, happening in my own life at the moment with doing my own version of morning pages, you know, every day. But it's uh, and with you referencing Ian, I was just thinking about that as you were talking about this, knowing that Ian was one of your former students. Uh, it really goes to show you that uh we are a lot more capable than we give ourselves credit for. And the point is not to be worried about if you're going to make a mistake. It's just, it's about consistently doing something every day, even in little increments, you know, like three pages a day, or even if you, you know, you know, stripped it back to a page a day, that's still better than doing nothing, you know, than, you know, with, with this kind of stuff. And I think, uh, you know, beyond all that, it shows you that like you had this conception about yourself that you didn't think you were capable of creative thought, which is insane to me to hear that. But I understand it because I have my own versions of that of, oh, I don't think I can do this, you know, fill in, fill in the blank with whatever that could be. And, you know, the fact that you realized your own ability and then passed it on to Ian, who has since passed that on to other people is such an incredible gift to put out into the community and he's not the only one i mean he's mm -hmm. just like he's he's an example um because yes. he's so he's so um focused on you know uh what his dreams are for himself and for his future family and looking yep. into the future um that he's a great example but, but you know yeah. i mean there's so many people that walked through that class that um that showed up saying i can't i can't i can't and if you can just get that out of, you know, get that, get yourself out of the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, you know, that was, that Julia Cameron book really did it for me. It's not the Absolutely. only thing. And mm -hmm. I had, um, I had other, all of a sudden other mentors started showing up. Um, mm -hmm. Another one um, was um, at that time, uh, I took a class at UCLA mm -hmm. in writing. Okay. And this couple taught it. And, um, and it was kind of the same idea. We would, everyone in the class would write something, um, basically kind of the way you would write to a title as a songwriter. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. We'd get a, a topic thrown out and everyone would write something about it. And then we would come to the class and we'd read it to everyone. And these teachers, um, it was a couple, uh, uh, my husband and wife, um, their philosophy was, no negative reinforcement yeah afterwards you're gonna uh, we're all gonna applaud and then we're going to go around the class and everyone's gonna say what they liked about what they heard yeah and that's what i did in the songwriting class that also works mm -hmm. and makes people less fearful about putting something on paper yeah or or recording something or or even their the way their voice sounds when they sing oh yes because yes, come that... on bob dylan come on 
you know. Right, right. Well, and there's so many people like that too, you know, that uh, with, with with that style of voice that you just mentioned, you know, that they their voice fits their music perfectly. And if you were to translate that into so many other situations, it would not work, but it works perfectly for what they're doing. Yeah, and are um, they telling a story? And, yes. and are they telling an interesting story? And are they holding your attention? Which yes. is another reason why in my class, um, this also worked. Everyone had an opportunity to present five minutes of anything. Yeah. They could get up and talk about what they did had for breakfast if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. They'd be on a timer, but most songs get a message across in five minutes. So that's another skill that's learned. You know, how many open mics have you been to, Jesse, where somebody gets up and and they sort of, you know, my guitar is not really in tune and it's a really lousy instrument and and I have a cold and I'm not going to sound good, and, you know, and oh, all, the, oh, all, the, all the disclaimers start and, you know, and then you're three minutes into them standing up there and the host is going to cut them off. And they haven't yeah. had a chime. They hadn't haven't haven't had a chance to tell their story. What a shame, you know. Yeah, it, no, yeah, exactly. We're it's, all uh, so fearful of, of sharing um, who we are and, 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 uh, and a story, you know? Yeah, well, absolutely. And that was, uh, whether it's an open mic night or I've seen that it shows too, if a band feels like uh, they're not well rehearsed, it's like, oh, well, we just learned this song a few days ago and, you know, it's not going to be great. And it's like, well, then you're giving people a myth, like a uh, preconception about this already. Whereas if you just did it, and even if you didn't go into it confidently and you just went, all right, here's the next one, you know, whatever. And then just left it neutral. You'd be a lot better than, you know, if you're, you're not just telling the audience that you're telling yourself that, and that's a, that's a big thing with uh, creativity that could be tricky at first. But I, that was actually going to be my next question is that with, you know, all the different types of students you've encountered, you know, different backgrounds, like I mentioned earlier. And, and as you mentioned, I think fear is a, a through line through all of that, that you probably encountered in many students and that crossed all sorts of different boundaries. And whether it's just, you know, I don't like the sound of my own voice. Like I can't stand listening to it because of however you think it sounds. I don't want to hear my songs back or I don't want to get up and play in front of people because everybody's going to be looking at me. Uh, that manifests in all sorts of different ways. Right. So how are what are some techniques aside from what you already mentioned that you know that you've used to get people out of their shell because obviously it doesn't happen overnight that it's it's you know with your class especially a lot of people would take that multiple semesters so you're seeing people developing over the course of you know literally it could be a couple of years and you see where the change starts and then how that takes place through when they left your class so what are, what are some ways that you were able to get people to overcome that fear and get them out of their shell? Well, I think um, I, I just have to say, to begin with, sometimes it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, right. you aren't, sometimes I wasn't successful, you know? Sure. Um, and, and that always made me sad, but I, hey, I give it a, gave it a shot. But, mm -hmm. I, but I think um, one of the main things is if, if the group is small, which by virtue of the fact that we did it in the piano classroom. So there were 20 pianos in there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes the class would be packed um, because, you know, word had gotten around that it was a cool class. But mm -hmm. when people realize the degree to which they had to be responsible to themselves, it always leveled out to be about 20 people. So if, you're, if you get a group of 20 people together, um, in a room for three hours a week for the space of a semester and, and cultivate a sense of community. It, ju mm. that, it just happens um, because there are going to be leaders immediately that rise to the occasion that say, oh yeah, I get what this is about. And, and they always get up and present five minutes of whatever. And, and they're fearless about it and say, look, you know, this week I came up with lyrics, check these out. Or this yes. week I, I came up with a tune, check that out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're getting approval from everyone because at, at the end of their five minutes, they always get applause. There's this encouraging, um, nurturing kind of vibe that it just isn't, um, 
isn't sympathetic to someone who wants to come in and and put themselves down right for five minutes or right or or, or even share at all yeah um, because it's a because because it's a it is a um an atmosphere of um of inclusion and and everyone is welcome to participate you know yeah. and um you know i th- i think one of the things that that kind of puzzled me that was a failure on my part that mm. that I'm still grappling with is you know in order to get any kind of grade in the class you had to do morning pages because I believed in it so much yeah and I had one guy that never ever did it um and so you know I I never was able to pass him in the class he yeah was a great he was the greatest rapper I've ever heard in my life wow um, Elliot McJimson is, was his name, is his name. He mm-hmm. lives in Vegas now. Um, but he was in the class for four semesters. He didn't care about the grade. Yes, yeah. because it isn't about the grade for heaven's <laughs> sakes. But, you know, he always just cheerfully accepted his D, you know, um, b- because he wouldn't do morning pages, but on the, sp- on the spot, you know. So he knew that he was included. Yeah. And, and he knew um, everyone approved of him. And so he kept coming back and, and sharing in his five minutes this incredible um, extemporaneous commentary that was, you know, yeah. in rhythm. And all of us were mesmerized. So, you know, my method is flawed sometimes. But, but in general, I think the answer to your question is inclusion. Yeah. And um, and a and a period of time to which you're devoting three hours a week with people that are creating a community. And my goodness, I mean, this group mm-hmm. never got sick of each other. They'd go out, you know, to what, yeah. buff, Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever afterwards. Um, they would be together yeah. be- before the class. They'd say, "Let's meet at um, In and Out before class." Yes. They'd be out in the lobby hanging out uh, on the break you know, they would bring me burgers. I mean, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's, um, yeah. and, and this wasn't, this wasn't from day one, but, you know, I saw it happen over the space of a semester. And then, yes. as you say, the, the real gift with that, um, with that class is we're allowed to, I don't know if they're allowed to do it still, that we were allowed to offer it four times in a row, you know, mm-hmm. so if you're a legitimate community college student, you go as a freshman first semester, second semester, as a sophomore first semester, yes. second semester. So if you're able to do that class four times, and and I always would require four songs a, a semester for mm-hmm. people to write, and that's 16 songs in two years. That's pretty good. That know? that is that is really good. If and you get if you get one good one, you know. Yeah. That's a, that's a good ratio, uh, 16 songs and, you know, especially for a beginning songwriter, 16 songs in two years. And then if you end up, you know, liking one of those and it's, a, it's a really good one, then yeah, it's, that's a, that's a huge accomplishment. And it's so funny. You mentioned the hanging out and the, the Buffalo wild wings thing, because you also taught a performance class, uh, uh, I forget the actual name of the class, but it was basically a band that you could audition for that was an ensemble that had the same sort of setup that, you know, usually people would take it four times and, you know, the band would stay fairly consistent and it was called a test flight. And that's been at Antelope Valley College for many, many decades and many students have passed through there, myself included. And it really, you know, there were people left over from when you uh, were teach after you had left Antelope Valley College, I think in 2009, if I had That's my a, information right. Very good. You have your information. Yeah. Right. I remembered the plaque in the front uh, when I was waiting for classes. There was a little plaque by one of the entrances to one of the music buildings. Oh, um, the plaque was still there. <laughs> it was still there. It was still, well, I started in uh, 2010. Is okay. when I started. Yeah, the so year that was after right, I retired. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm, that was right after high school for me was that graduating. And then I was there for a couple of years, few years doing performance classes and, you know, the same thing, just going through the motions of all these different uh, classes. But yeah, there was a sense of community that was carried on through that because there were students that were still uh, around from your classes that were there for 2009, you know, from 2009 on, like I think 10, 11, 12, they were still taking classes there. And we would go and after our performance class got done, test flight on Tuesday nights, we would hang out 
afterwards until you know 12 30 1 o'clock in the morning and those are some of my dear friends to this day because we spent so much time hanging out together because there was this sense of uh support there and you know coming from a, a student's perspective as well you know when i started taking those classes i was going through my own life change and going through a hard time and you know it was one of those things that going to those classes not only got my mind off of things that were happening outside of class but it was uh i, I felt like a really supportive environment so i could show up and play bring in a song idea and it was just nice to have you know something like that that was supportive you know the, in my life and i know that there's a lot of students that probably felt the same way you know after they got done with their program yeah we um you know just um in terms of every performance class my own philosophy is to try to foster community um, yeah. and um, because and the reason why is there are so many payoffs in the music business because you know you really have to bring um your desire to to create with your fellow musicians um to the table you're not going to get called to play gigs if you're a jerk <laughs> you right. know right. so my my goal as as a teacher of of test flight which i can't remember what that called that class was called at the was time either popular yeah. instrumental performance i think was the technical name but that yeah, was that was been, that was only something like that but that was our commercial music ensemble something like that yeah uh, it had been it had been through a bunch of different titles mm -hmm. be, just because of uh of what was required from yes. um, from the state yes. for, for things to be called mm -hmm. whatever but right. um, you know <laughs> right. we just wanted to we what we were wanting to do was to create um a lab kind of situations, a kind of situation so that people got performance experience. And I, right. and, and I inherited that desire from my colleague, Glenn Horsepool, because that's, he's the guy that came up with the idea with the title test flight, because yeah. we're, you're all in aerospace country out there. Yes. Um, and I thought it was a, a really great idea. And the reason why, just a little history, is because um, back when he started the program in the, in the uh, I'm, I'm going to say the mid eighties. Yeah. There mm -hmm. still was this, this huge, um, on Sierra highway, there were all these hotels and motels Yes, and they all had rooms where people where bands could play and mm -hmm. they were, they would hire bands, you yes. know, it wasn't, wasn't about, um, recorded music or, or house music or anything like that. Every hotel had a, had a band. Mm -hmm. um, and so these kids all wanted to be employed. Um, and then the next step would be if they got to be, you know, playing at the Desert Inn. That was a huge yes. gig at the time. Yes. Um, if they got the gig at the T Desert Inn for a couple of years, then maybe they could get a gig in Vegas because that was huge, too. Mm -hmm. Antelope Valley musicians heading to Vegas. And you'll find a lot of Antelope Valley musicians still in Vegas. Oh, but, yeah. Um, but but um what glenn horsepool observed was that these kids would be going over to the desert inn and they wouldn't have any performance skills to speak of mm -hmm. um they they their mic technique was a, lo a little lacking um you know they wouldn't have scoped out the venue ahead of time and so they'd be setting up way past the time when they're supposed to be playing and right. you know just things like that so just things like that were the things that we would address in test flight um, with, with, uh, with the students, you know, that were in it. And that just creates camaraderie, you know? Mm -hmm. And like you say, at, when you're done, um, with, with your rehearsal, you're winding up chords, just like everyone else. If yep. you're, a, if you're a singer, yep. um, you know, you've got tasks to do to help mm -hmm. the sound, to, to help the sound engineer. And, you know, we're all in it together. And then, you go to Buffalo Wild Wings. You know? Yeah, it's uh, there's there's very limited places that are open uh, to eat after about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. So it was yeah, there's there always or, there's always yeah. a place to go, though. You know, in our time, it would have been Caro's or Denny's. Or, yeah, you know, that like, yeah, that was another one. I think uh, after my group sort of migrated out of test flight, I think the next group coming in always went to Denny's and that was the place that they picked. So they they carried on the tradition of hanging out afterwards just in a different uh different environment but uh i think all of this 
is, you know, and I've talked with this, we, uh, the very last one, uh, that we just did, um, you know, that'll be coming out at the end of June, uh, is, uh, Trey Balfour, uh, oh. teaching at Little Rock High School. Oh, and, cool. and even with Ian's and in this lecture, there is the overall goal of trying to take some of these principles that we are accustomed to as musicians and, you know, in, in the artistic and creative scene of being respectful and, you know, being open-minded and accepting people and having all this stuff that we talked about, like trying to apply it to our community in whatever way that we can, because I think that it's something that unless you experience it and you live in it for a while, then you're not like, you don't quite get it. And it's also in the sense of like, it, you can understand how all these things work, but when you feel it and experience it, it's like, wow, this is so joyful. And this is so great. I, uh, you know, you want to have everybody kind of, you know, be a part of that sort of, uh, ideal. So, um, I don't know, what are some ways that you think that in our community that we can sort of foster that same environment that you had in your class, obviously a class of 20 people versus, you know, a community of 500,000 plus people or more is different, but, uh, I think that there's ways that we can translate that into our community. And I wanted to get your take on that. Well, it's hard for me to be, to make any kind of observation because I, I hang out with musicians all the time. That's, that's true. That's um, true. And, but I don't know, maybe I, I bring that energy to the table whenever I walk down the street um, because, you know, there, and part of it, um, I think the pandemic helped us in a way in that mm -hmm. regard because you're not seeing anything you're seeing eyes. Mm. And so your, your, your eyes have to convey so much without being able to see the rest of the face. And so, um, you know, when you're in the grocery store, just, just to look someone in the eye, that's kind of a skill that I grew up with because, you know, my dad always said, look someone directly in the eye and then shake their hand firmly couldn't shake hands anymore, but you know, um, just that kind of communication is, yeah. um, I, you know, that, that philosophy of, of my spirit greets your spirit. How are you doing? Yes. yes. You know, I, you, you can't see my smile behind my mask, but it's, it's in my eyes. So it, something just as basic as that, but you know, having a helping, a helping nature rather than a, a a constant desire to disagree um, yes. and a listening nature, you know, these are just sort of basic human characteristics that, um, that I think then um, rather than being judgmental of people and this carries uh, um, over to the whole songwriting creativity mm -hmm. thing yep. is, you know, not just judging, man, I hate that guy's music, you know, to yeah well yeah. you know if if you like it and i think you're cool well, i guess I, i'll give it a chance you know yeah. I mean, it, it's coming from a creative spirit somewhere and so that then hopefully makes you less judgmental of yourself mm -hmm. and makes you more open to creating something yourself and understanding the process and therefore being more sympathetic to the whole creative process and what brought somebody to create something um, right. Okay. It's, it's, it may, it may be music you don't like. It may be art you don't understand. Um, but somebody, a human created it. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, give it a chance. And then, you know, you can always say, eh, not for me, but, yeah. you know, there's no sense in being um, so, so incredibly critical of it because I know people literally who, who get up in the morning and they're critical of everything. That's yeah. their, that's their day. And yeah. that's not going to help you create anything. No, uh, it, it definitely, you know, that's something that I've worked on in the last couple of years with, uh, last few years, I should say, with my own creative process to the point of, and going back to what you were talking about, just sort of putting those governors on your mind and what you think you're capable of, of oh, well, I, I can't do that. Well, why? Who? what farmer's almanac rule book are you reading that oh yes it says here that you exactly can't do this and no that's not the case and this sounds a little silly for me but i'll share a little personal anecdote 
I, for the longest time, I would not post any videos of me playing on social media at all. And like, if I was filmed at a show on a stage with a band, feeling like I had rehearsed and prepared for it, I would post a video of that, but would never put up a camera in front of just in a room playing because I just didn't think like, oh, well, I'm, I'm clearly not good enough to do that. I'm good to be on a stage with other people, but I can't just play in front of people. And while I was just recently in Nashville on a sort of post-vaccine trip, uh, I was at a buddy's place and he had a bass there. It was not my bass and wasn't set up the way I would like it and had a little amp that, you know, oh, you know, I need to have like, you know, all sort of my sound, my proper sound dialed in and everything, all of these factors. And I hadn't played in, you know, a, almost a week because, you know, it was like with traveling out there. And I thought, well, what better time than now to, you know, if I actually want to get over this sort of, you know, uh limitation i'm putting on myself what better way than to like have all of the conditions that i you know think are not ideal to do this and it seems really silly but it was this thing of like yeah i'm not going to put limitations on myself anymore and i think that comes through starting you know doing things like you know writing down stuff every day morning pages it comes from you know just making little you know increments every day to you know sort of uh, change things that you want to change about yourself and exploring this through creativity is a great way to discover all of that about yourself. Yeah, it really is. It, it um, and it, you're right. It, it's, it is incremental and sometimes it's hard to even trace when changes occur, mm -hmm. but, but they do. And that's why to me, this whole, the, the morning pages idea is yeah. so kind of magical and I don't, I don't know why it works, but, um, but it does, and it, it does make you um, more forgiving of yourself and therefore more fearless. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, yeah. why, not, why not try it, you know? It's like, you know, we could get onto the whole subject of, you know, why am I painting now? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. be because I can, <laughs> yeah. you know? Cause, yeah. You know, it's, it's you, you know, but sometimes you have to have somebody sort of give you permission, you know? And, <laughs> Yeah. If you see mm -hmm. somebody else doing doing something that looks like it might be fun, why not try it? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, I, I think it's also removing those expectations on on yourself, because if you if you sit down and you think everything is going to be a home run or a hit, you know, and it's anything less than that of like, I'm going to sit down to write something, paint something, you know, whatever it is, a song story, and it's going to be great. I think it's good to have that confidence in yourself, but I think just putting that expectation on it, then if it's okay, or if it's good, then you're going to feel like it's not worth doing. Or if it doesn't get the reaction you expected, you know, as far as like, oh, I'm going to do this, or I created this thing, and I'm going to put it out there, and people are going to love it. And then if people are like, yeah, that was pretty good. And you're like, what do you mean pretty good? I put my heart and soul into whatever this piece is. And you know, I think if you can remove that expectation, and um, I think there's a quote uh, that I read recently, and um, it's either uh, the I Ching or the uh, uh, Dao or Tao Te Ching. I think it's a Eastern philosophy book. Right. It's talking about living. Uh, I think in the book it was described as living in innocence, because if you you know live in ambitions and expectation then that's like just exercising your ego and that's not going to get you the results that you want and it's sort of in doing creativity for myself and i say doing creativity and just summing up all of like my writing and music and everything being involved in creativity doing activities like that you sort of strip those barriers away after a while slowly over time and then you just realize you just have to do the best you can and not worry about, you know, all these different factors on it. You know, you have, you, you don't want to put any qualifiers on it. You just need to go for it. Yeah, exactly. And, and you and I both know that when you, st when you sit down to write something, it can take a totally different turn from where you intended it. To yes. Go. You know, yes. all of a sudden characters are showing up that you're going, who's this guy, <laughs> you know? And, 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 yeah. you know, it's like that happens in songwriting too, that, you know, it's like mm -hmm. I, I, I sat down to write the song about such and such and then it turns into something totally different and you got to kind of go, go 
you, you can't have this argument with yourself as no, I intended it to be this. Yeah. Because it might turn out to be cooler if you go the other direction, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. The best I and I'm sure you could say the same thing. The best reactions I've had to anything I've ever put out there are things that one, I didn't think would do that well for whatever it is, as far as just and, and I I mean well in the sense of, you know, whoever you know, is in your social circle, whoever enjoys what you do creatively, you put something out there. It could be for me, sometimes it's been articles I've written. And then other times it's been songs and other pieces I've written with bands. And it's, you know, anytime where there hasn't been expectation on it or not a lot of them, or you think, oh, well, this is just kind of, you know, this is just something I did. And you throw it out there. That's when you get the most compliments on, oh, wow, that was really good. And then you're always dumbfounded by that because, you know, it's right. what you sometimes what you, you know, consider to be just, oh, this is just something I did almost like a throwaway thing. It will re it could really resonate with somebody and who's to say what's right and wrong with with that, you know? Yeah, totally. You just have to trust the process and put it out there. And, you know, it, yeah. if, if if it's uh like you say, if it's something that resonates with people, that's what you're going for. You know? Yes, exactly. I think that's a great point. Um, and so in summary, um, just sort of talking about, you know, summing up all of the creative things we talked about, um, what would you say is your own, um, how should I put this? Um, I guess, I don't know, your your goals for, you know, what you would like to see what i guess what you would like to do teaching wise still or if you know mentoring or if there's any other things on the horizon that you would still like to do as far as you know passing things on to a artistic community or offering your talents and skills uh just anything in that regard yeah that's tough because when you're retired um um it's it's like all of a sudden your forum is gone um, yeah. and so, you know, basically I've, I've just kind of been enjoying myself. Mm. Um, but, um, um, one of the ways I enjoy myself is by teaching. And so I, I'm, I'm, um, and then the pandemic hit, I, um, I had before the pandemic, I had maybe 10, um, piano students, um, that came to the house and, um, every level, mostly beginners but different ages, adults mm -hmm. and, and, and kids, and I'd never taught kids before. Um, so for me that it was a challenge because I'd never taught privately yeah. before. Um, so that, that was fun. And then the pandemic hit and immediately there were kids that were like, yeah, I'm all over it. Let's do FaceTime lessons. So I still have five students that I teach um, remotely and that has worked out really well because um, for me as a teacher and as a communicator, I had to figure out ways of, okay, how am I going to do this without um, doing any kind of duet playing? Yeah. Because lo lots of times my favorite technique was, okay, you play the left hand, I play the right hand, and let's see what this sounds like together. Um, you can't do that anymore because of the time delay. So, yeah. you know, just figuring out d different techniques um, for teaching has been fun. Um, but as far as the creativity part of it, um, I guess that has yet to be figured out because um, I'm painting a lot. Okay. Um, and I got that permission from our buddy Dan Byrne, mm, um, yeah. who, you know, way back in the, when the internet first started and people were having home pages, you know, mm -hmm. um, he was one of the first guys that, um, that had a, a page with his, like his own web page that um, that had not only samples of his music but his paintings. I'm going, what? Yeah, you can paint and and compose music at the same time. So that's about the time that I started experimenting with painting. But when I retired, I really started doing it. And um, so I've got an Etsy store and I'm selling paintings. And I, you never could have told me 20 years ago that I'd be doing that. But yeah. um, as far as sharing it, I think it would be cool um, to take yeah. to take these um, these ideas that I used in songwriting and applying them to a painting class, or yeah. uh, or even a writing class. 
Um, it's just finding the forum to do that. And, you know, I mean, I've, toyed with the idea of applying for let's let's go teach at the rec center or let's go apply at city college which actually i've done um but you know there just aren't um there aren't opportunities to do that for mm, me right okay. now yeah. so you know i just i kind of look around to see how i can be useful and um one way of doing that is you know i still have all these relationships with students all the way back to 1978 wow. on the dreaded Facebook. <laughs> so, you know, and, you yeah. know, I mean, it's, and it's just so fantastic to me that I, there's this couple that got together in test flight, Walker and Lindsay Gibson. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who now have a, a, a 15 year old, 14 or 15 year old who's ready to audition for test flight. Wow. And, yeah. And it's just like freaking me out, you know. So I yeah. kind of feel like, well, in a way, I'm I'm still participating because I, I still am in touch with those guys and, and yeah. offer th offer them encouragement. And um their daughter is incredible, you know. Mm -hmm. She's the stuff she's doing during pandemic, she did a whole performance of, of Hamilton, which mm -hmm. she did the whole whole orchestration for. I mean it's like but anyway, I'm not answering your question. Oh, but. no, no, no. That's actually that's actually perfect because uh, you brought up um, I, I wanted to talk about Dan Byrne a little bit before we uh, headed out. But um, yeah, it's uh, using the example of uh, Walker Gibson and, and Lindsay, who, you know, Walker is a staple in the music community out here, you know, in, in many ways and is is very talented and involved in so many different things out here. You know, he's. Uh, with shows I've worked at LPAC, I've seen him there doing community theater stuff with with his wife and his daughter. Uh, I've he's you know played solo acoustic shows out here, shows with a full band, and you know very much a part of the music scene. And so, again, it's we're going back to you know realizing your own potential, and then if you're not afraid to pass on your talents or share these with people, you could have all sorts of impact that you didn't necessarily plan on having before you know ian walker so many of your former students uh many of whom that i'm friends with you know that comprise most of you know my closer friends and yeah it's 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 uh i think it's something that because this creativity is a natural trait you know people who are involved in these classes pick up on that and you know people recognize the commonality in each other and it all it all sort of ties in together so it's very relevant yeah. And, uh, you know, you also with, you know, uh, your creativity, you know, would do things outside of classes like uh, for those that don't know, Dan Byrne uh, is an accomplished singer songwriter and uh, wrote some songs. Uh, uh, Roger Daltrey uh, used one of his songs, uh, Regent Street, in one of his albums, two songs. Yeah. I don't know what the other one is. I'm still trying to find out. But he had two of Dan's songs on his mm -hmm. latest solo album. Regent yeah, Street being one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, wrote songs for the uh, uh, John C. Riley movie Walk Hard, that was a parody of all of the music biopics, and had some songs in that. And uh, yeah, through you know Laura's friendship with Dan, uh, she hosted a couple of uh, house concerts in the Antelope Valley, where Dan would just come out here, and there would be a small little intimate setting, and Laura would invite former students and colleagues and people like that, and you know, have uh, Dan Byrne out to the Antelope Valley and we would have a private house concert and he would talk about songwriting and, you know, sort of share his process and the story behind the songs. And uh, I wrote about one of them for uh, one of the columns I did in the paper and um, Dan liked it and it you know, was pretty well received. And it was just great to be in that room and, and feel that sense of community that you were talking about and to really you know, see all of these different people that knew you and were connected with you and, you know, were connected to music and creativity coming together. And, you know, it's something that I hope that, you know, through talks like this and, you know, these conversations and hopefully in-person events uh, coming up that we can uh, help bring some of that back and help, uh, you know, help grow that little increments at a time in the Valley. Yeah. He's, you know, the, the thing about Dan is, I mean, I, I had been following his career for years and then chance meetup on highway one mm -hmm. there he is in the in a in the line for hamburgers and yeah. my my husband saw him first and, and started singing one of his songs 
And he was standing in, Dan was standing in front of us and Dennis started singing one of his songs and he turned around with this kind of look on his face like, <laughs> yeah. and um, we got to talking and, you know, it came out that I'd taught songwriting and um, he said, um, well, you know, I've never taught a songwriting class, but I'm about to teach one. Could I use your students as guinea pigs? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't have a budget to pay you or anything. He was living in Los Angeles at the time. He said, oh, I'll, I'll just come out um, if you'll let me teach your class. He ended up coming out to the songwriting class at ABC um, probably five times. Wow. And giving a workshop. Talk about generous. You know, I was able to scrape together a hundred bucks for him for gas. But, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he just, he just, um, he had some really great techniques for songwriting himself too. And then just setting a, an example of what can be done. He's got this great, have you ever listened to his radio station? Uh, I have a little bit. I need to listen to it more often, but yeah. I've, I've heard it. Mm -hmm. I learned something from it every time I listen to it because he, he um, he puts together the whole playlist himself, and um, you can hear anything on that station from, um, you know, the the Martin Luther King "I Had a Dream" speech to um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, "I'm the greatest" mm -hmm. speeches to um, like obscure singer songwriters mm -hmm. to famous ones. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it's really a great tool just for music education. So, and that's just out there for free for anybody, mm. you know, and so that's another way that, you know, I just kind of, he was a mentor big time for me. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to at least get that in there because it's a good example of how you shared, you know, what you had and, you know, just different connections and, you know, trying to bring that, uh, you know, ability to uh, your songwriting students and, you know, allowing them to have that opportunity was a pretty incredible thing. So uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to thank you again, Laura, for, uh, you know, joining us today, a part of the Bridge Builders uh, lecture series. And uh, we thank you so much for not just uh, sharing some of your insight on uh, creativity with us today, but just your service to the artistic and music community of the Antelope Valley for so many years. We, we all appreciate you very much. Thanks, Jesse. And likewise, um, I really appreciate what you're doing in terms of bridge building too. Oh, thank you so much. So thank, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, we will do another one of these uh, at the end of August and just make this a recurring monthly series. So please subscribe to the Palmdale Library page if you haven't already. Uh, if you would like to see somebody on this series that we haven't had yet, please leave a comment, send us a message. Uh, and we will try to work that out. And please keep uh, in contact with the library about all of our uh, exciting events coming up uh, as the COVID restrictions are lifting. So thank you again to Robert Shoup uh, for hosting this. And thank you to Jamie Lee Beck for recording. Uh, have a great day, everybody.